So, hallo ihr. Macht mal zu Beginn alle eure Kacheln an, das ist schön, euch kurz zu sehen. Ja, herzlich willkommen euch allen zum 16., tatsächlich 16. Kinotalk schon. Wir hatten jetzt ja eine längere Sommerpause und sind jetzt froh, dass wir äh, euch hier wieder begrüßen können. Ähm, das Gespräch wird aufgezeichnet und am Freitag auch für alle anderen, die jetzt heute es nicht schaffen, äh, haben sie die Chance, sich das anzuschauen. Ähm, ja, wir schauen alle mit großer Sorge nach Iran und sind total froh, dass es einen Film gibt, der so nah dran ist an dem Thema und möchten heute Abend, ihr habt den Film gesehen, möchten äh, heute Abend über den Film reden. Welcome Ali, great to have, you, to have you here. You're on promotion tour in New York right now. It's great to you are here. Found this time tonight or this afternoon in New York to be with us. Um, thank you for this fantastic movie. It's um, in, in, incredibly intensive screening experience watching it. And I'm really, really happy we can, all of you, we can have you here tonight to talk about the film. Welcome Ali. Welcome Sarah Fasilat. Sarah, wir kennen dich gut. Uh, First mm -hmm. Gewinnerin für, um, für den No Fear Award für Nico. Du warst nominiert für beste Rolle, Nebenrolle für, für Nico. Und wir freuen uns, dass du hier mit dieser tollen Darstellung, die du in diesem Film gemacht hast, ge geleistet, gebracht hast, heute Abend irgendwie auch da sein kannst und mit einem Gespräch mit dabei bist. Hallo Sol, Produzent des Films. One, two Films, kein Unbekannter in diesen Runden natürlich. Äh, Produzent von vielen erfolgreichen, tollen Arthouse-Filmen. Um, und über die Produktionsgeschichte wirst du uns auch gleich ein bisschen mehr erzählen. Und ich freue mich, dass wir heute um, als erstmalig eine neue Moderatorin haben. Das ist Nastaran Tahiri Fumani. Die uh, Nastaran, uh, I, I think I switched to English now, Nastaran will <laughs> help us uh, with the discussion tonight and uh, she will mm. lead the conversation. So uh, mm. I would say Nastaran is a moderator. Yeah. She's also working for the Berlinale, the Queer International Film Festival. And I'm very happy you're here tonight and mm. welcome you all. The floor is yours. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, because my German used to be much better, but I think like I should make a fool of myself. So I stick to English. Uh, uh, but yeah, <laughs> I get tempted to speak German, but I, I don't think I should. <laughs> yeah, but you can also try it if you want. <laughs> yeah. How you feel comfortable. So thank you for the invitation and um, yeah, Ali, thank you for creating this movie and showing um, actually a very horrible case uh, to a broader audience. And I was very moved in various uh, forms because um, yeah, you have an unusually high sense of creating a elusive unsettling atmosphere in so many layers. And right now hitting very uh, deep also with the political current situation in Iran. And my first question goes um, to you, Ali. A film is based on um, uh, real events. And uh, I was wondering how your approach was and um, how the process was of creating this movie and um, creating this Persian noir or film noir film and maybe you can explore a bit on this. Mm. Um, so, you know, I've been working on this for like, you know, like various uh, different uh, periods of time in around say 15 years almost. So I've tried to condense, uh, you know, this to the most important stuff. Um, I think the case itself was, of course, very, you know, it was a sensational case when, when it happened. And I was, you know, like many other people, I think I was fascinated by or alarmed and fascinated by the magnitude of, like, this guy's, you know, murders, like how he could kill 16 people in one year. And, you know, it's like the sort of the sensational part of it, which is like the, the first layer that catches your attention. And then when he was caught, there was another twist to the story, which was then, you know, a, a sizable minority and, and, you know, the right wing or more right wing papers and, and, you know, some, you know, militia groups and whatnot in society, they started supporting him and they started calling him the, the, the hero. And, and he, you know, he became this sort of strange, unwilling hero. Um, 
So that added another layer to the whole thing that is, this is not only a murder story, but this is a murder story. This is a bigger sort of, it has bigger implications uh, in society. And then I think added to that was when I saw the documentary about this guy, who, which came out uh, a year later, there was this documentary uh, that Mazyar Bahari has done. Uh, and in which uh, he talks to him, the guy himself, Saeed Hanoi, the actual guy, and his family and, and various people around it. And I think that I was kind of shocked to see the 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 interviews with Saeed Hanoi because at that time I had created this um, image of a monster uh, in my head. And then I saw the, the, the interviews and it, they felt quite, I don't know, like I had like sympathy for the guy in a strange way because he felt innocent in in a you know he felt really like innocent in a way that not innocent in like he of course has done horrendous stuff but innocent in a way that he really it felt like he really thought he was doing the right thing and the way he was talking about it and and you know and this was really like I was really fighting for myself because you know you don't want to have sympathy for a person like that and and you know all these starting to add up to a more complex, layered um, uh, story. And in this process, I think we went from uh, making a story about a, a serial killer to making a story about a serial killer society. And I think that sort of informed also the, the dramaturgical choices and like, you know, how to balance the story between, uh, you know, Said's character and Raimi's character and all that. And, you know, I also tried throughout the whole process um, because I knew, of course, you know, I'm not naive. I knew that this there is a very political nature to this uh, story, as was in the real case, because, you know, Said Hanai, uh, the actual guy, being a devout Muslim in the city of Mashhad, which is, is so this is a very special special city. You know, there's a lot of political context to that, uh, especially in the Iranian context. So I knew that this would, you know, be political. But at the same time, I tried to, um, you know, keep my distance to politics so that this doesn't become an overtly political film or it doesn't become like a movie critical of Islamic Republic because I felt like for me, those movies would be like a theme movies, you know, a, a, a sort of a topic movies. You know, I didn't want to do a movie about like women's rights issues in Iran because I don't think, I, I felt like when I have so, I'm using so much time and energy and resources, I need to like, come up with something that cannot be done or said in an article. Um, so I try to sort of keep a little bit of a distance to like being overtly political. And in the course of, you know, movie coming out and the reactions, the very negative reactions that we got uh, already in Cannes when opened um, from the Iranian government and all the, the conservatives and their... Uh, their uh, uh, cronies and 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 afterwards also you know uh, with all everything that has happened in Iran, there is a point where where I'm like, yes, this was not my intent to make a political movie or a political statement, but now the movie has a life of its own. The way it's interpreted in you know in the light of what is going on in Iran, that is not something I can control nor I'm actually unhappy about it. Um, but there are also like interesting things that happen. I mean, like, you know, you've watched the movie and, and probably some of you at least would feel like, okay, it's violent or, you know, maybe even excessively violent. And, you know, these are things that we've heard before. And in that context, for example, I think it's really fascinating to see like some of the same people that felt that movie was exploitative and heart hitting almost like to the point of being misogynistic itself when we premiered. Now, when like seeing what is happening in Iran in the context of all that, 
now understand maybe our mission statement better and have a different opinion. So, you know, the, the movie is the same, but its context is, has evolved to a different context and, and thus also like some sort of the interpretation of it. Um, that is a little bit how the journey has been um, from my side at least. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ali. So um, as one of the two producers, you were involved in, I guess, nearly every step uh, of the process. Can you um, tell us how you met um, Ali and what interested you most about this project? And um, yeah, what challenges did you have to face during all the process? Yeah, um, well, I had known um, Jakob, who is the Danish producer of the film, Jakob Jarek from Profile Pictures. We had been like minor producers on two other films before. And this is how we got to know each other. And then in Cannes 2018, just a couple of years after Ali's second feature, Border, had premiered, Jakob asked me if I wanted to join Ali's third feature. So Jakob and Ali had um, done many films together at film school. Also, then Ali's first feature film, Shelley, which played at Berlinale. Border, Jakob didn't produce, um, but they were kind of already hooked up for, for, this, for the next film, which they've been wanting to, wanted to do since before Border even. And um, I hadn't seen Border, but I just heard like the word on the street, how people were talking about it. And it was like, yep, yeah, I mean, like no questions asked. Um, you know, usually we would read a script and 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 all these these uh, things to vet a project, but this was a very clear decision and an opportunity to be working um, with Jakob and with Ali on this. And everything started normal, you could say. Um, Ali and I, we actually then met in Toronto a couple of uh, months later. Um, we were supposed to meet in Munich, but uh, that didn't work out for passport reasons, I remember. Um, but then in, in Toronto we met and we we had a plan and we would we would we were supposed to come in as German partners, raise some money through for post-production, through ZTF Arte, um, and like be responsible for roughly, I would say like 20, 25% of the budget max and uh, and handle the post-production in Germany. This was going to be our role. But then COVID came, like we were we had the financing more already in play, more or less in place. We were ready to go, and then COVID came, and um, Jakob was in a situation where he had two projects um, that were hit hard by COVID, a big series and a feature film, and his company is also relatively small, and it wasn't clear how they were going to handle this massive loss, so he was just like, okay, I don't know how to handle this project right now. Um, also, due to the fact that Jordan, which was the country that we had scouted and decided we want to shoot the film in, had just closed their borders. So we had we had the money, we had a director, we didn't have the country that we wanted to shoot in, and we didn't have the manpower and the main producer. So we were really in a, in a difficult situation. And Ali, rightly so, said, uh, guys, if you can't find a way how to make this film, um, I'm out, more or less. And it was like, oh, uh, you know, for me, even as a co-producer, it was a pro it was a real problem. We had um, we had no other projects going. It was the beginning of, of COVID, of the pandemic. Nobody knew what the future would bring. I had my second child on the way. I had three employees to feed. And I was like, okay, I might as well just close my shop if if this project doesn't come along, even as a co-producer. So we then looked at different options who could actually then maybe take over from Jakob. And um, Jakob was looking at even other companies in Denmark, or we were looking at a Swedish co-producer. But at some point we decided the cleanest cut to keep, keep everything of the structure in place. We would basically reverse roles. Jakob would become more of a co-producer. I would take over more responsibility of the pre-production, the post and the, sh uh, the shoot and the post. And, um, and in doing so, this also gave me the opportunity to raise more money. Um, so I can a little bit proudly also say that we raised 1.3 million more um, after I took over, which put me like in a position to be like the majority producer of the film with more than 40% and Denmark with around 30 and then Sweden and France sharing nearly 30%. Um, 
And this is how this film was produced. We then um, decided to set up the production in Turkey um, because it has a land border to Iran. And we thought, OK, it, it could also. Well, first of all, Jordan was closed, but also we were hoping it would give us a lot of benefits to bring in people, cars, uh, props, um, like logistics seemed to be easier. Um, and locations was going to be a little bit harder, but we scouted for quite a long time, quite extensively different cities in Turkey until we narrowed it down to two cities. And all this time, after all these weeks in Turkey with a lot of people, we were spending a lot of money. We were waiting for a shooting permit. And, um, and at some point it became a bit ridiculous because this permit is just something that's very, you know, it's a very standard procedure for a foreign producer to reclaim the VAT. It's not even something where a committee needs to approve anything. It's, it's a standard procedure, but it didn't come. And so at some point I started doing some digging and we found out that uh, our application had gone from the Ministry of Culture to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the, um, to the Turkish ambassador in Tehran. And from there, it was like, no, support this project. So we knew this, but we couldn't know officially. So we had to fly uh, to Ankara, Ali, myself, our line producer, Ota, and uh, a Turkish service producer, the four of us, and at the Ministry of Culture, they welcomed us like, oh, such distinguished guests. And we were like, yeah, please, let's talk about our shooting permit. They said, yeah, maybe you should talk to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So they got us a meeting there the next day. We met at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Same thing, such distinguished guests. But when we wanted to talk about the ap shooting application, they said, oh, no, no, but we don't give these. You have to talk to the Ministry of Culture. So they, you know, they were really playing ping pong with us in this sense. And um, we realized, OK, we're not going to make this film. So there was a lot of confusion uh, and, and, and bitterness and, and sadness in our team. And, uh, and it took some time to like really collect everyone mentally and to get everyone back into the space. OK, we're going to go again. We're going to try again. And luckily, Jordan had opened their borders. Um, we, you know, during the pre-production, we encountered quite a few other issues course, including COVID, we all caught it at some point just before we wanted to start shooting. But also we lost our lead actress. Um, we had like two actors from Iran. Actually, we had more, but like the two lead actors, um, Mehdi Bajistani, who plays Saeed, um, and a young Iranian actress who was cast for over a year. We had long conversations about what it means for them uh, also in the long run and how we would help them and support them and protect them um, after shooting the film. And then she came from Iran and after the makeup and hair test, at some point she came crying into my room and said, I can't do it. And, uh, and she left. And, and after a couple of really hectic days, um, Ali and Zah, who was our casting director, who would help us put together the film for like three years. Um, you know, after a couple of intense late night casting sessions, uh, it was decided that Zah would step up and play this role and uh was a blessing of course she Zah was actually also cast for the for the for the for the um for the wife of Said. so we had to find someone else for her we flew someone in from Norway who turned out to be pregnant and had nausea through a whole shoot so there were many many things we had to deal with and um and you know now we can laugh about it like you see three smiling faces but like we were not laughing a lot when we were in Jordan it was really tough it was hard um and uh once we finally started shooting with a lot of delays uh, we shot for 35 days straight had a couple of incidents also during the shoot but we got everything in the can and um yeah <clears throat> plowed through the post-production and at some point also after a few hiccups which uh i could also go into but like it would just take too much time uh we we finally you know got got into can competition which was our first goal from from the beginning which we're extremely happy about and since then the film has been on a on a really uh, great ride and like we've we've ticked all of our boxes that we that we hoped uh, hoped for that we worked hard for until now um yeah sorry this was a long answer but it was you know i could 
I could fill a podcast for for ten hours, which would be probably <laughs> equally thrilling as the film. Uh, but but uh, yeah, this should be enough for now. Thank you, Sada. Thank you, Sada. Um, you played the role of one of the victims, and uh, your role made it very hard for Said. And a chapeau for your Mashadi accent. Uh, I was very <laughs> impressed. Um, it was really brilliant. Um, I'm wondering what aspects of the role were most interesting for you, and um, also out of a feminist perspective, I was wondering um, how was it for you to play one of these victims and um, yeah, and how were your preparations concerning this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, actually one of the challenges was the Mashadi accent <laughs> because I have never uh, been to Mashad and I have not uh, heard Mashadi. And when Ali came up with Mashadi, I also lately said I was thinking about can we not take Bavarian accent because I grew up in Germany and this is a familiar mm -hmm. accent for me, but Mashadi, I have never heard it before. So we had a coach and via Zoom, we were training and doing this Mashadis and then I was WhatsApping Ali the sentences and stuff like that. And the next challenge uh, was also because, as I said, I grew up in Germany, I had to adapt to the mentality, to the Iranian mentality because of course, the language I'm talking is Farsi, but the way uh, and the things I'm understanding things and picking things up is more German and more direct and not because Farsi is a really poetic language and people are really polite and really talking like this. So I had to adapt and at the same time to put it in my uh, in the character that it's really um, at least that it's believable that people believe that it's a person from Mashhad and she, she's grown up in Iran. And that were the things I was thinking about. And um, in terms of, yes, she, she is a victim in terms of she's dying, but uh, her character is not a victim at all because growing up in this kind of society, and especially, I mean, in every society, we think a lot about uh, what other people think about yourself and stuff like that. In Iran, it's even more. And Zainab is a self-confident, fearless woman who is turning somehow the whole mentality and doing the things that uh, men, for example, are treating women this way. So she's picking it up and turning it around and the way she is handling it and she's doing what she wants and what she thinks she wants to go through. And she's not thinking about what others think about her. She doesn't give a damn thing about it and this is also something I could learn from Zena because I think in every society uh, we think too much about what other people think of us instead of just living our lives and um, this is why for me she is not a victim at all yeah mm -hmm. yeah thank you very much and um, we're pointing out um, you know this um, society and also like the circumstances um, these people are being socialized and I was wondering also because uh, Ali also mentioned uh, Mashhad as a very um, particular place as a very traditional place for Muslims and also a very holy place for pilgrims and um, yeah and we saw in the movie also Said feeling entitled to cleanse the city um, of uh, poor and um, drug addicted women that have to prostitute themselves. So we're facing kind of a society that is um, traumatized also through war, also pre-war because of the monarchy and so on. So it's like a very, very big um, history of scars and of, um, of pain and trauma. Maybe you can um, explore a bit more on this Ali and Asada also um, and also um, what it has to do with the current situation like the feminist uprising or also like the uprising of all the oppressed groups um, that have to live I, mean, is, uh, I think it's a really good uh, you know um, insight into this whole thing because Mashhad is really a special place uh, it is a little bit like Vatican meets Las Vegas, you know, yeah. um, it, it, you know, it historically, I think the city has been like, just like desert basically. And, and uh, the Imam Reza shrine, which is like eighth Imam of Shia Islam uh, was buried there. And then they built this shrine that became over time, the biggest mosque in the world, the biggest mosque complex in the world. And the city itself is built sort of around it so like it is really like literally in the center of the city 
And, you know, you can see that this, like, there's an endowment um, that runs the shrine, which is one of the holiest places for uh, Shia Muslims in the world. And, you know, takes care of all the pilgrims that are coming from different countries and blah, blah, blah. And this endowment, uh, it is said that it's one of the biggest conglomerate in the Middle East, at least economically. It is, I mean, they do everything from real estate to like doing like tomato puree to doing like, you know, bread and have factories and agriculture. And, and also there's a tradition of, people um, devoting like, you know, like for example, piece of land to Imam Reza. And it, this all goes into this endowment. And one little uh, detail with this endowment is that it's tax exempt. Mm. Um, so it, this is just to say that, um, this, you know, this is the aspect that is not necessarily in the, the movie itself, but, the, you know, this city is run really by by the socio religious mafia which is called the endowment of this thing i mean it, it is it is really like it it's you know it could be it could be any you know uh, like a godfather four or whatever you know um and then you have you know um this really strange contradictions in the city of mashhad which is you have the pilgrims coming there and all that. And then after the pilgrimage, it turns out that these guys still need to have fun. So there are like sex workers right outside of the shrine, you know, right outside, like it's like 100 meters outside the shrine where they start. And this in itself has become a part of like, you know, as, as with a lot of things with the Islamic Republic, there is, this, there is a, like a really special perverseness to it, you know? which is like people come to this like religious slash sex tourism, you know, this has really become a thing. And, and the city of Mashhad and it, it you know, it's, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, it would be generalizing to say a city of five or 6 million people, they're all into this, of course, but there is a general understanding with who people who run this city, which is a huge city. It's the second largest city in Iran. It's a big metropolitan area now. There's a general understanding that they, these guys have sort of accepted the situation. And I think part of what, you know, someone like Saida Hanai's anger was, like directed to, was the fact that I think instinctively, instinctively, he felt that. He felt that this is not a situation that just happens because, you know, uh, uh, you know, it happens to, to some some girls happens to be there. This is a situation that has deeper sort of roots, you know, and, and pe there are more people on it, so to speak. Um, on top of all these things, there's also the fact that Mashhad is a big hub for drug trafficking because it's strategically placed close to the like two, three different borders, among them the border from Afghanistan. And for the... Um, uh, you know, for this, you know, for the region where it is placed in, it's a very, it's, you know, it's, a, it's the richest, most important city in that region. And there is a, like other metropolitan areas in, in Middle East, there is like always this like really like horrific slums where people like, you know, it's like living there and they're extremely poor. So, you know, when you put all these together, it is really a noir city. Mm -hmm. You know, it is really a city that, you know, um, that during the day is this like sort of dusty big city vibe that you would get, you know, many other places. And then during the night, it transforms completely. You know, it's like you have these neon lights that come from, you know, it's like there's always some sort of religious something going on there. And there's a sort of festivities and like. They, they also because they, you know, it's Mashhad is the crown jewel of Iranian state. So they want this city to be as clean and as beautiful and as efficient and as modern as possible, really. And they spend a lot of money and the streets, are like, you know, it's like, and then you have that. But in that you have sex workers, you have drug addicts, you have, uh, you know, it's like hustlers, you have uh, all these tourists uh, who are looking for these things. So it is really, 
it is really complicated. And I think that complexity of contradiction, what I find fascinating about as a filmmaker, I mean, there's a lot of, I don't want to go into the sort of the moral argument of what's right and what's wrong, because I think that's very clear. Uh, but what I find fascinating about as a filmmaker that it is really a place that is a good representative for how the Iranian society works, because, you know, we're talking about the, um, you know, the current situation and uh, the, the extreme misogyny and violence against women. And, you know, which is which is it doesn't I mean. Of course, it can be very in your face as like they're crushing folks, people's skulls with, you know, batons or they they just like randomly killing people. But it can also be as little as, you know, you know, in in the heat of the the whatever um, July, uh, you're still not allowed to loosen your headscarf as a woman, whereas as a man, you're allowed to go out with T-shirts, you know. Um, but when you look at all this, there is also another aspect to all this, which is there are also women MPs. There are also women ministers, even in this like really conservative governments we've had. And there are like lawyers and doctors and whatnot, you know, many of many like, you know, well-educated women, even in this society. There are more women, uh, there are more girls in the higher educational institution in Iran than boys. It's been like that for like at least 10, 15 years. So, you know, and, and you know, people were, for example, saying like, oh, let's look at Saudi Arabia is like becoming so progressive now because they suddenly like let people, let women drive. And, you know, it's so celebrated in the Western media you know, with that standards, Iran has been progressive for like hundreds of years because women were driving, you know, since cars came. Um, so it is that that complexity and contradiction that I think makes this an interesting, you know, proposition. And, and I think Mashhad is really like a good, like a crystallization of all that. Yeah, thank you. Um, in Hamburg and also in London, you um, demonstrated solidarity also with the feminist uprising uh, that is uh, taking place. Your crew and cast were wearing uh, T-shirts with um, Zanz and Negi Ozadi, so women, um, life, freedom. And um, you were dressing up as a mullah or as a ayatollah with um, vampire teeth and um, being uh, all over with blood. Um, what do you think about the current situation in Iran? And um, you, you're demonstrating, so you're like trying to um, bring it out in the world because, yeah, Western media is not uh, on the, yeah, let's, yeah, whatever. What do you think? <laughs> well, you know, like I was saying earlier on, I, I've been throughout my filmmaking career, I've been trying to stay, like, keep my distance to like direct politics, because I think that as a filmmaker, that is not what my expertise is. That's not where, where my heart is. Uh, and, and, you know, and I also like really didn't want to become part of this Iranian diaspora where like I'm criticizing people in Iran for like, or like my fellow filmmakers because they're doing stuff that are such and such. Um, and, and I'm, you know, living comfortably in Europe myself and under very different circumstances. So I didn't want to like fall into that part. But I think there was, you know, you know, four or five weeks ago, there, there came this point where I felt like this is not about what I feel and what I think and what I think is appropriate for my career or whatnot. This is really about like, being a human being, you know, if I don't react to a 14 year old being beaten to death and then her body is being stolen from the family and then they, the family who comes and mourns them being shot at and then the mother being like forced to come to TV and confess in front of the cameras that her uh, daughter was mentally ill. If I don't if I don't react to that, then I don't know what I'm going to react to. 
And I think at that point, I was like, I was so angry that, you know, I felt like holding a sign or like saying a chant or whatever, or writing a tweet would not make it. It's not enough. And, and you know, I was, I, I was talking to my friends and I was saying, you know, I think we should do something that, you know, on the social media, like on this feeds, you know, we should do something that can uh, compete with those like, dogs and cats videos that everyone's watching you know like it should be very clear it should be like very banal and simple and i think that imagery for me is not you know um not like the the uh, the iranian state and the media has like been calling me the the clown uh and and i'm like I'm, i'll be like happily be the clown you know if that really hurts <laughs> hurts you and and you know elevates the cause I think this is the moment that everyone has been talking about for the past like almost half a century. This is the moment that in every report, every you know um, piece about Iran in the past, I don't know many years that I've been reading in the like the Guardian or Der Spiegel or or Washington Post or whatnot. There's always this like postscript which says. Yeah, situation is shitty. Everything is shit. The government's bad, but some maybe one day would their their young generation would rise up and do different and blah blah. And that is the moment. It is now. It ha- it is happening as we speak. Um, you know, uh, the the fact that women are marching in the streets and men are marching behind women, uh, fighting for their rights because they know if women get their rights, then it's also good for them. That that kind of like political um, education and understanding is like I it's it's like completely unprecedented. I would say in Iran, even in Middle East, anywhere really. And I already see that you know this is inspiring people in. Afghanistan, in in Iraq, in uh, Syria, in in Lebanon, you know, it's like in in all the neighboring uh, uh, countries and people, because you know our our situations are not entirely different, really, in the region. Um, so I think that this really, for me, is the most legitimate um, movement that has come out of Iran since like 1979 revolution and there is every reason to listen to these people there is every reason to support there's I, right now and i hope it stays this way there is a unity between people that i've never seen before there's a unity like iran is a very ethnically diverse fragmented society with like extreme wealth differences extreme class differences and also like this like thing that you know the the sexism that has been ingrained that also has helped to fragment the society between men and women and all that and and i think that th- this movement is really shattering all those limits and if a like the people in baluchistan uh, in southeast of iran are getting shot at the Kurds in the Northwest are supporting them. If people, if, you know, 14 year old girls in some, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, high school are, are being attacked, the bus drivers are going on strike to support them. You know what I mean? And it, it, it is, it is, you know, frankly, it's incredible. And it, it, it's incredible in the literal sense of it's hard to believe. Um, so I think that when the situation is like this, I'm like, I do anything. Like if I'm, if I can juggle balls and be a clown, I'll do that. If, if I can talk to people, I'll do that. If I can tweet, I'll do that. If I can do a video, I'll do that. I do anything I can to, 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 you know, elevate and, and help this cause. Mm -hmm. I would also like to add something because I think it's also really important because the, what you said, the media is not really reporting about what is happening there. And basically it is about human rights and uh, the society in Iran, this is the good thing. Everyone is standing together, man, woman, Kurdish, mm. 
Iranian people, whoever, but somehow uh, the, the Western media is not reporting about it. And I don't know how it's possible if you, if you hear stories like uh, children are getting raped in jails and asking their parents to bring them uh, abortion or anti-baby pills and stuff like that. So every one of us would be like, oh, it's not, so we have to make a change. We have to put awareness. And uh, even like with our film before it was, it, I mean, nobody, when we had the release in Cannes, we had not the political situation like it is at the moment. And nobody had seen the film before, and it's based on the documentary, on a true story, but every one of us got really bad messages on social media, and they were trying to um, frighten everyone and stuff like that, and this is a situation um, which is existing there, and we are living outside there, but people there, this is the reality, so the censorship of Instagram, which is a sensitive uh, Thing you cannot watch this is the reality they are living it and it's important to make it aware and to really start to change something over there and i think if i can just add for us you know it's it was just shocking uh to see how this 20 year old case has become so relevant uh all of a sudden you know like ali said how unbelievable it is about everything that is happening um we never thought this would happen during this this time right and uh and of course it puts us in a in a situation where we're like okay we definitely ali you put it quite nicely recently when you said like we are not going to surf the wave with the promotion of our film basically but on the other hand if our film can serve the conversation you know like if if this means that our film will be broadly released and will will keep the conversation going and people can understand much better, um, you know, why the film needs to be the way it is. I mean, what I, my learning curve, my personal one was the, like, you know, I, I always understood that this film is like the, like the antidote to the normal Iranian cinema, you know, like where Iranian cinema that has been suffering from censorship and Iranian filmmakers had to find very beautiful poetic ways and created a, a way that, that that you know that we in the West also love, you know, like like these very complex, morale, interesting, but like very poetic kind of films, which kind of hint at certain things, but dare not say it. And and Holy Spider is the complete opposite. It's totally in your face. It's like a punch to the gut, but it's necessary because it shows things that you could never see in an Iranian film. And um and and if if people flinch away or if they're in the cinema and they don't want to look because it's so hard and so tough, it's like, I don't want to say it's nothing, but it's like in comparison to the things that are really going on in Iran, I feel it's necessary. And I feel it has a, a right to exist in this sense. Can I just, sorry, politely remind you that we will lose Ali in 12 minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I'm um, sure somebody in, in the audience, because it's very, it's extremely interesting to listen to you guys, but I'm sure there's maybe some questions from the audience. And so while we have Ali, we should open the floor to. Absolutely, Maria. I was about to do that, to open uh, now the conversation. Sorry to go in between when we're yeah. sitting. Like, we're it was on my own fault, I think. Like, no, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Are there any question uh, comments? Please feel free to ask. It's a little abrupt now, I guess. Mm -hmm. We can, all, I mean, Nasa, and I'm sure you have a couple of more questions. Like, I'm sure something will come up. Yeah. Continue. But I see Anna. Anna was ah. uh, raising her hand. No, sorry. Ich, ich wollte nur vormachen, dass man sich meldet. Ach so, sorry. <laughs> okay, but you could just go on and do everybody who has a question just raises their digital, digital hand and we, we, we observe that and that you know yeah no because um i was also wondering you know um why talking about the uprising or the revolution that is uh, ongoing right now and um yeah as we said earlier it's there is no going back it's just a going um to the front do you think because i, I usually don't like to ask this question because it's always a bit <laughs> weird but do you think you're gonna show this movie in iran soon Um, Soonish. I mean, if the question is if people in Iran are gonna 
be able to watch this at some point soon? Yes. If the question is, are we going to show this in cinemas in Iran? Not yet. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, we were, Jakob and I, like we were joking that like, you know, right after Cannes, um, like I think we were, before everything blew up, uh, we were trending on Twitter. Like there were, there were comic artists take, making their own take on Holy Spider. Everyone was bashing the film. It was one of the most talked about subjects in the country. And, you know, we were, we were half jokingly saying like, if we could find a way to actually show it's absurd to have a film that is there is so much demand people would love to see it for sure um but there's just there's just no way of course at this point in time but maybe you know when when change will come hopefully sooner than later maybe there's a chance but i think the the iranian piracy is uh is a, is a blooming industry so as soon as the film will be released digitally i think the first country to release digitally will be france then uh, the pirates will, like other people will be making a lot of money on this film, I'm sure. Mm. So there is the chance. Um, I mean, actually, the piracy in Iran really works very good and maybe it's already there. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I'm once again looking into the round, uh, seeing if anyone has Pega, Pega Feriduni. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, could you tell us something about your main actors and your main actress? Uh, Za had to leave Iran a couple of years ago and Mehdi is staying in Germany right now. Uh, can you tell us about them and their stories, please? Sure. Um, so Za has this very particular story, which is, you know, Actually, interestingly enough, it has a lot of parallels with, you know, the the women movement in a way uh, in the past, say, 15 years uh, or like the development of that in Iran. Um, she used to be a, like a major TV star in early 2000s. You know, there was this uh, big TV show uh, in Iran on, on the state TV. And at the time, I think in early 2000s, the competition was not like there, there weren't that many channels and venues so it was like i think she was like extremely famous at some point and the star maybe even uh you know for like the regular people and that all changed when her private video uh like a sex tape thing that leaked and again There you see like the difference between say U.S. and and Iran because like in the U.S. that made Kim Kardashian a major star, you know, basically. Um, in Iran, what happened was that they they thought or they assumed that she has done that herself to promote her own like fame, and she got into questioning and she got into like trouble with the the legal system and she they threatened her they and and you know they were pressuring it and all that at the same time outside of the same building where they were questioning and 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 you know pressuring her they were selling the dvd of her sex tape in the street that is Iran. <laughs> um and then you know she i think she tried i mean uh, this is you know i i don't know the de the whole details of the things but i know this much that after that she tried to work in in the business uh, and then she was like you there would never be a chance for you to work again here she tried to do like photography she tried to do other stuff but there was there came a point where like they basically stopped everything that, that she was doing the message was you're just not welcome here anymore in the country and you can go home and rot or you can leave and that's what made her leave and came came to france and you know as you know as as an actor yourself you know uh, how tough it is when you go from a country like you know you're an actor you have the skill set you have the the you know the talent but you might not uh, know the language specifically and the culture so for someone to come as a fully formed actor talent to a different country and start from like zero again 
and you know she's been doing all sorts of stuff and you know uh, i mean she was at some point you know like some years into her residing in 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 europe start acting again but never on the same level as you know she was in iran and and she started doing casting work uh for a few you know projects that's also where we met um and and you know i have to say like there is a i never again uh i would love to take credit for coming with the genial idea of like casting her and seeing this you know like her rising from ashes and all that fantastic uh you know metaphor but really all this came out of necessity for us <laughs> came out of the fact that you know um we were working on the project for so many years together the casting took so long she was so invested in the movie already and it felt like a natural uh, uh, uh you know um thing to do uh, to go with her for for Rahimi but one of the biggest joys of doing this movie for me has been seeing her going back to where she belonged as a star and seeing that people who were so skeptical of her you know even some of my friends even some of like my queen even some film people who were like almost felt a little bit pity for her at some point that oh you know she used to be a star but now you know she's not an actor anymore now like she is a major that she's someone to reckon with you know and it really it, it is it, it is such a great feeling that i've been in my own little corner contributing i mean like she deserves all this of course and there's nothing i've done to make her better but i just am happy that i'm part of this thing that part of this story really um and and i feel a little bit <laughs> almost the opposite with mehdi i feel like if i had a little part in like making zar's life slightly better i'm sort of destroyed mehdi's life <laughs> um because in a way it feels like you know when when i met mehdi um in when was it maybe 2019 first and we did the casting and and you know i did like extensive casting for you know as you know uh, for for both parts and you know at some point i was considering to going with like some maybe more well known stars of iranian cinema and all that but but then, then there is this thing with mehdi which is so unique which is the combination of he's an excellent actor of course but also he is from that region he is from that area he has ridden motorbikes all his life he has worked in the construction like he knows he knows that life he knows that social class he knows all that you know it's not an abstract thing for him it's not something that he needs to go and research it is part of his life experience and to actually find that person who's also able and willing to take the risk that this project means that's almost like a little miracle in itself i have to say so there's like there's i don't think there's anyone else who could do this part except him like when when he exists and sometimes i feel like you know i mean the guy had an okay life in iran he had his really good theater career he he was getting noticed you know in the right places and and all that and and now he's you know he's in berlin in this limbo um you know and i really don't want him to go back to iran right now because i would be very worried about it um and i cannot feel a little bit guilty about like okay i'm sort of this is a real human being's life that you know we can talk about art and we can talk about responsibility and of course he's a he, like a adult and you know we have had a lot of conversations about this but still you know i feel that you know sometimes i feel like was was that the right decision that i contributed to uh for him to be in this situation i don't know uh, and and then you know the maybe my <laughs> my more idealistic you know part would say well maybe there comes a time in a year or two we all go back to iran and we have a proper fucking red carpet and these guys really get what they deserve which is meet their real audience yeah i can i can just add to this just you know for for you who are interested and pega thank you for bringing it up um 
you know, we had to, to we had to make sure that that Mehdi would be outside of Iran, of course, when the film comes out. And of course, when we when we finished shooting the film, we didn't know that the film would go to Cannes, but this was our hope. So we actually got him out of Iran. We, we finished shooting in uh, June, July, and we got him out of Iran in October, um, way before we knew anything. But we also felt it's important for him to start building a life, trying to build a career for what come, what, what may come after. And uh, we first got support from the medium board and NIPCO and had him in Berlin for three months. And after that, we were very lucky to get uh, the Martin Roth Initiative, uh, which is uh, co-financed by Auswärtiges Amt. And we actually managed to get support for him for like 12 months, um, which, you know, pays his rent, uh, pays, gives him like pocket money. Like, you know, my company is basically the, the contributing partner. So this, you know, this goes way beyond any normal uh, producing uh, duties, uh, really taking care of him. We have been doing this now for like 13 months now and have a couple of more months left. But um, come come next February, um, you know, he's, he's, he's now looking into a couple of new jobs, uh, which is great. Um, but, but he really needs the support and this wave of, of the film to, to establish himself in the, in the, in the, in the, um, yeah, in the, in the acting, uh, world or in the, in the, in the cinema world, because he's very well established in the theater world, of course. Um, so we, you know, we're, we're open for any ideas that anyone might have, uh, mm. because he's in Berlin and, um, has a lot of time right now. And it's, of course, you know, Zah has very much become the focus of everything right now. Although a lot of people, a lot of critics have also said, of course, that his performance is equally amazing. You know, recently we had to vote for the European Film Awards and I, it was very sad for me because I went through the entire list and I saw his name and then there was like a little, he wasn't eligible, you know, because he's not European. All of our, many of our other European, uh, Iranian actors have a European passport. So um, I, I want to think that he, you know, he could have maybe been nominated even, um, but 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 then he couldn't, you know. So so we need, we all need to kind of support and help him, which is what we're all trying to do right now. I just wanna uh, because I need to go, and you know this um, might be a. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It might be a little bit of a weird thing to say in this moment, but I just want to say that you know the the whole like German film community and the, the funding system and, and the festival people, and all, they've been incredibly kind and helpful to us in a way that I never thought, you know, I, 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 I you know, in, I think that this goes really beyond, you know, a, like a co-production thing. And, and this is like, I really feel that, this movie has a home in Germany, a proper home in Germany. And, and, you know, I, I think it's great to know that this, this is possible, you know, that this can be done and that the, because, you know, in a way there is this wave in Europe that, that is, or in the world maybe with like more sort of narrowing down nationalism and what a national identity is what is a swedish movie and what is russian music and what is you know and i think the the fact that we can still do this kind of thing uh it, it is actually heartwarming uh, and 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 you know as 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 someone that i that you know i find myself very much in the sort of cross crisscross of working in different countries with different people, with different nationalities and doing the movies in different languages. I always found it like, you know, this, this movie wouldn't have happened in the U S you know? Um, and, and, you know, I think it's, you know, I don't, this is not a, you know, I know that you guys are not like the representatives of, German film industry, but I think we are all part of it, and this is just a thank you to everyone uh, uh, that, that is part of this and everyone who's been supporting us, 
and everyone who made us feel at home. And as Saul was saying, went beyond the the sort of the production of duty to make this happen. So yeah, for my part, I'm I'm uh, very happy and grateful that that this went through the way it went. Yeah, thanks, Ali, for your words. There's some hearts popping out here in Zoom, so I think uh, yes. like applauding. Yes, at doing this. <laughs> yes, it's uh, yeah. hard here in New York as well. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I have to leave you guys, but thank you so much for for inviting me, and uh, I wish you a good continuing conversation. Also for you, have a lovely evening. Oh, evening. It's not evening in New York. Yes. Have a lovely I will at some point. <laughs> yes, at some point. Thank you, Ali, for taking the time and for being with us tonight. And much love from the German Film Academy. And thank you for this thank movie. You. It's really inspiring. Thanks, Ali. Thank you. Great listening to thank you. you. Have a good time. Bye. And all the best for thank the you movie. Thank you, guys. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. So, ich, um, also, can I switch in German now? Ja, war. Ähm, ich schaue noch mal in die Runde. Falls es Fragen gibt, Kommentare, ähm, wenn Sie irgendwas teilen möchten, sehr gerne. So, ich, und ich, möchte, noch da. ich möchte einfach noch ganz, ganz kurz anfügen, weil, weil also das, Ali hat das so ein bisschen verklausuliert. Also ähm, als, als SARS intimes Video geleakt wurde, hatte das sehr deutliche Konsequenzen und es ging tatsächlich um ein Jahr Haftstrafe. 100 Peitschenhiebe ähm, und äh, 10 Jahre Berufsverbot. Und ähm, am Tag ihrer Vollstreckung im Prinzip ist sie geflohen ähm, und, äh, und hat seitdem den Iran nie wieder betreten. Also das ist sozusagen schon ziemlich heftig gewesen. Und ähm, sie hat das am Anfang immer dementiert. Das ist das, was ihre Anwälte ihr geraten haben. Und hat aber vor vier Jahren angefangen, öffentlich darüber zu sprechen. Und ähm, ja, also nur um das, um, um da die Fakten sozusagen einfach nochmal sehr klar zu kriegen. Ja. Danke dafür. So, ich schaue nochmal in die Runde. Wir dachten, dass wir uns vielleicht alle nochmal gleich groß machen, dann sehen wir uns noch ein bisschen besser, oder? <lacht> sehr gerne. Gerne. Ja. Mhm. Es ist für uns ehrlich gesagt sehr ungewöhnlich, dass es keine Fragen gibt, aber vielleicht, wir haben ja auch schon viel geredet und mhm. viel gecovert, aber ähm, jede, wir, also Sarah und ich freuen uns natürlich über jede Frage oder Anmerkung, die ihr auch habt vielleicht. Ja, Mika hat eine Frage. Mika hat eine Frage. Und zwar war das denn dem Hauptdarsteller vorher bewusst, ähm, dass das die Konsequenzen haben würde? Oder kam es sozusagen dann ein bisschen überraschend? Nein, 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 über, überhaupt nicht überraschend. Also wir haben sozusagen, also die, beide Darsteller, ur, beide ursprünglichen Darsteller waren anderthalb Jahre vor Drehbeginn besetzt. Ähm, der Film ist ja auch dann eben mehrfach verschoben worden, also wirklich lange Zeit. Wir haben uns einmal auch alle zusammen in Istanbul getroffen und je näher der Dreh rückte, desto intensiver kam sozusagen auch die, die äh, ja, die, wo wurden die Bedürf Bedürfnisse angemeldet für das Danach? Und ich konnte halt immer nur sagen, ähm, ganz ehrlich, ich kann euch nichts versprechen. So, das Einzige, was ich euch versprechen kann, ist, dass ich mir, gelinde gesagt, den Arsch aufreiße für euch und alles tun werde. Aber ich kann euch jetzt auch nicht versprechen, dass jetzt ein Stipendium oder dieses großartige, diese Martin-Roth-Initiative, dass das klappt. Also, ne, und ich, ich werde einfach alles tun, was ich kann, aber ich kann euch jetzt keine Sicherheiten, hundertprozentige Sicherheiten bieten. Ja. Ähm, natürlich haben wir sozusagen auch bei, bei, den, bei den Gagen, natürlich bei den beiden berücksichtigt, dass das ein eventuelle äh, Zwischen, Zwischenaufenthalt im Exil sozusagen noch beeinflussen muss. Also diese beiden Gagen waren ein bisschen höher angesetzt als das insgesamt Gagenniveau. Ähm, aber ähm, ja, das, das, war den, das, das, das war beiden sehr bewusst. Und für Medi war das tatsächlich so, ja, er war in der Theaterszene sozusagen sehr etabliert, aber die Theater waren noch zu. Also alle Theaterschauspieler äh, im Iran in, in der Corona-Pandemie saßen zu Hause und sind durchgedreht. Und ähm, für ihn war das auch eine Chance, 
eventuell aufs internationale Parkett eben zu kommen. Und da ist er jetzt. Nur muss er jetzt auch natürlich auch selber so das Beste draus machen. Ist auch klar. Ich habe noch eine Frage zu den Dreharbeiten. Und zwar gab es da, also ich weiß ja, also ich kenne mich zum bisschen wenig aus, aber in Jordanien ähm, ist es, ist wie die Stellung der Frau in Jordanien ist, keine Ahnung, ähm, gab es da Probleme? Also mit bei den Dreharbeiten oder gab es da irgendwie Anfeindungen, wie dann klar wurde, worum es geht oder so? Ähm, grundsätzlich ist sozusagen Jordanien im arabischen Raum ein verhältnismäßig äh, offenes Land. Ja? Also es gibt sozusagen, es gibt Orte, ähm, da haben selbst unsere iranischen Schauspieler gesagt, huch, das ist ja wie im Iran. Aber dann gibt es auch wieder andere Orte mitten in Amman, da denkt man, man ist irgendwie auf der Kassanienallee. Also das ist sozusagen, es gibt, es gibt beides. Ähm, wir hatten durchaus den einen oder anderen irgendwie haarigen Moment. Äh, es gibt eine Szene, wo, wo die beiden, ähm, also Sharifi und äh, Raimi, die beiden Journalisten im Auto fahren, nachdem sie mhm. die Eltern von der ersten Prostituierten, die umgebracht wurde, ähm, besuchen. Und, ähm, und da sind wir durch die Wüste gefahren und als wir dann sozusagen unseren, unseren Kamerawagen und alle sozusagen umdrehten, kam, also Halt machten, kam plötzlich irgendwie wirklich mitten aus der Wüste so fünf Beduine mit Steinen bewaffnet und wollten irgendwie die Kamera zertrümmern, weil äh, die dachten, dass wir mit der Kamera, die auf, auf, auf dem Auto aufgeregt war, die Frauen filmen wollen von der Hochzeit, die da irgendwie stattfand. Und da gab es dann große Aufregung und... Äh, dann hieß es, dass dann haben unsere jordanischen äh, Regieassistenten das beruhigt und haben das geklärt und haben gesagt, das ist alles okay, können wir, wir können es jetzt nochmal machen und wir müssen einfach nur an einer, an einer anderen Stelle wenden, ist kein Problem. Leider hat sozusagen der vorne in der Kolonne war das nicht ganz mitbekommen und hat uns wieder genau zur gleichen Stelle geführt. Und beim nächsten Mal umdrehen standen dann schon 50 Leute mit Steinen bewaffnet. Und es war eine sehr haarige Situation, die... Ähm, ja, fast, äh, also fast, fast tragisch geendet wäre. Zum Glück ist nichts passiert. Ähm, also ne, das ist sozusagen so das, ähm, das Maximum an, an Anfeindungen, sozusagen, was wir erlebt haben. Aber ansonsten ähm, haben wir wirklich eigentlich großen Support aus der, aus der Branche. Die haben da eine Filmcommission, die sehr hilft. Die haben auch einen Tax Credit, der ähm, auch ja, ausländische Produktion unterstützt. Die haben uns mit allen Visas geholfen und es ähm, war insgesamt doch eine sehr gute Erfahrung, in Jordanien zu drehen. Wir haben es sogar geschafft, Autos aus dem Iran zu importieren, was äh, keiner für möglich gehalten hätte. Also, ja. Oh, okay. Dankeschön. Weitere Fragen? Kommentare? Ich denke, wir haben Zeit für noch eine Frage. Andrea? Ja, Andrea und... Mh. Andrea, du bist noch stumm, glaube ich. Hört ihr mich jetzt? Jetzt. Okay. Also ähm, das, das eine, ich, ich finde den Film wirklich extrem ähm, gewalttätig, aber ich finde ihn auch extrem wütend und ich finde ihn geradezu gedrängt in, also mit diesem, ähm, mit dieser Contempt für äh, gegenüber Frauen. Das äh, fand ich wirklich bemerkenswert an dem Film. Aber ähm, ich, ich würde gerne mal was wissen zu der Musik. Die finde ich ungewöhnlich toll. Mhm sehr klug, sehr gut, also fantastisch gesetzt. Mhm. Was ist das, wo kommt das her? Was ist das für ein Komponist? Ähm, wie ist die Zusammenarbeit gewesen? Könnt ihr da was zu erzählen? Auf jeden Fall. Ähm, mhm. Ali hatte sozusagen bei der Musik, wie in vielen Positionen, hat er sozusagen auf zwei Kräfte vertraut. Also wir ja, hatten zwei Editorinnen. Ähm, wovon die eine ist, ist eben die Editorin von Aska Fahadi und wir mussten sozusagen ihre Credits auch entfernen, was aber zu spät war, weil es hatte sich schon umgesprochen und inzwischen hat sie ein Arbeitsverbot ausgesprochen bekommen im Iran. Aber ähm, es gab eben auch zwei Musiker, es waren beide Musiker, ein Däne und ein Schwede, die, ähm, die auch für Border zusammen die Musik gemacht hatten. Der eine ist so ein klassischer Filmkomponist Martin Dirkhoff, der mit Ali zur Filmhochschule gegangen ist, der eher so aus dem Bereich Sounddesign kommt. Und der andere ist eigentlich so ein Popstar aus Schweden, wenn man so will. Und die sollten sich eigentlich zusammenfinden und die Musik machen. 
Ähm, der Schwede hat sich dann aber sozusagen mehr und mehr ausgeklingt und am Ende lastete sozusagen alles auf dem Martin aus Dänemark. Und äh, der hat dann tatsächlich äh, wirklich bis zum letzten Mischungstag äh, noch die letzten Musiken geliefert ähm, und das alles gemacht. Für Ali war das wichtig, dass er es sozusagen nicht in so ein ja, typ, in, in, so ein, in so etwas kippt, was so typische orientalische Klänge vielleicht mhm. hat, sondern er wollte sozusagen so ein etwas Unerwartetes, so ein, so ein eigentlich so einen iranischen Grunge nennt er das sozusagen, mhm. ja, ähm, der sozusagen dröhnend sich teilweise über den Film stülpt. Ich finde die Musik auch großartig und ich danke dir auch für die Frage, Andrea, ähm, weil die, ich finde die auch ganz besonders und auch gegen den Strich so, das, das erwartet man so nicht. Und ich meine, ihr habt den Film jetzt alle auf dem Link gesehen, aber wenn man im Kino sitzt, dann, dann haut es einen richtig um und geht einem direkt in den Bauch. Ähm, das ist schon sehr speziell. Und ich glaube, das hängt alles damit zusammen, dass Adi eben von Anfang an sagte, er möchte so einen persischen Noir machen. Ja? Also das ist ein Genre, was es, glaube ich, so bislang noch nicht gibt. Ähm, aber genau, das war so ein bisschen die, die Idee, da neue, neue Pfade zu bestreiten. Okay. Danke. Ähm, Pega, du hast dich auch nochmal gemeldet. Ich habe das, danke, ich habe das jetzt noch schnell im Chat schreiben wollen, weil ich muss mich leider verabschieden und wollte nur kurz anmerken, äh, dass ihr mit diesem Film tatsächlich äh, Filmgeschichte schreibt in vielerlei Hinsicht. Also zum Beispiel sieht man zum ersten Mal in einem äh, iranischen Film äh, Sexszenen. Und diese ganze Drastik, diese, also dieses sozusagen Verzichten auf Allegorien, das ist auch komplett neu. Und dafür möchte ich mich bei euch nochmal herzlich äh, also bedanken und mich verabschieden. Vielen Dank. Danke. Ja, das war, also es war, ein, es war natürlich ein großes Thema. Und es war auch wirklich während der, ähm, Während des Drehs, während des Schnitts war es wirklich immer die Frage, wie weit muss man gehen? Ja, und Ali war eigentlich immer derjenige, der das so gegen alle Widerstände, auch vom Weltvertrieb, auch vom Verleih und so weiter, gepusht hat. Auch für mich persönlich, äh, ne, wenn ich ganz offen sprechen darf, ich finde auch, der Film könnte einen, einen Tick weniger gewalttätig sein und würde in seiner Botschaft nichts verlieren. Ähm, aber ich verstehe ihn auch und ich verstehe ihn jetzt, seitdem das alles im Iran so explodiert ist, auch noch besser dass das so sein muss und dass das eben genau der Gegenentwurf ist zu diesem Kino. Ja. Ähm, Thierry Fremont hat Ali nach der Weltpremiere ähm, irgendwie das Mikrofon in die Hand gedrückt äh, und, und er hat dann gesagt, und ich, im ersten Moment bin ich zusammengezuckt, weil ich dachte, das kann man doch selber nicht sagen, er sagte, today is a great day for Iranian cinema. Und, äh, aber was dann folgte, war eben, dass er meinte so, you know, women have... Women have hair, women have breasts, women have a voice. Und, ähm, und da, da ging das eigentlich los. Das war wirklich so ein Prozess. Sa hat bei ihrer Dankesrede in Cannes gesagt, next revolution will be female. Das ist fast schon prophetisch, wenn man irgendwie bedenkt, was jetzt irgendwie gerade gerade los ist. Ja? Also es ist schon, ja, ich muss mich selbst immer wieder sozusagen wachrütteln, dass wir jetzt so ein unglaublich, ähm, treffenden Film haben irgendwie. Aber diese Themen, und das ist uns, glaube ich, auch immer wichtig gewesen zu sagen, sind auch nicht nur iranisch. Ja? Also Misogynie, ähm, Prostituierten, Morde äh, gibt es in, jeder, in jedem Land und in jeder Gesellschaft. Und ähm, ja, jeder, jeder kann sozusagen sein Liedchen davon singen. Ja. Hm. Okay, die dritte letzte Frage, Mika. Sie sind, äh, du bist noch äh, stumm geschaltet oder Sie sind noch stumm geschaltet? Du passt schon. Ähm, ich, ich wollte sagen, natürlich ist der Film sehr gewalttätig. Ähm, also er ist schon, er, er nimmt ein, er hat mich ziemlich mitgenommen und beschäftigt mich sehr. Ähm, aber gleichzeitig ist die Gewalt, die Frauen tatsächlich täglich erleben in nicht nur im Iran, sondern in vielen Gesellschaften einfach noch viel, viel, viel härter, als es ein Film jemals zeigen könnte. Also das wollte ich jetzt nur mal zum Gewalttätig oder so. Ja. Und, und wollte und noch ganz kurz sagen, noch Werbung machen für einen Film, der heißt Voices from the Fire. 
Und da geht es praktisch, also geht es um Prostitution und um Menschenhandel und um Frauen, die eben in die Prostitution gezwungen sind. Und der ist also auch sehr, sehr bewegend und wirklich toll. So. Danke. Ja. ja. Wie gesagt, toller Film. Jetzt. Mir, Dankeschön. Mir, mir geht es mir so, dass ich auch diese letzte Szene, das ist für mich eigentlich der größte Horror dieses ganzen Films. Und äh, zu wissen, dass diese Szene sozusagen eben ohne Special Effects, ohne, ohne Make-up, ohne Stunt und, zwar, und direkt aus dem Leben gezogen ist. Also weil Ali hatte diese Dokumentation erwähnt ähm, und, und diese letzte Szene aus dem Film ist wirklich eins zu eins aus dem Dokumentarfilm kopiert, wenn man so will. Ja, also zumindest der Interviewteil mit dem Jungen, wo er sagt, ich werde die Arbeit meines Vaters gegebenenfalls fortführen, wenn es kein anderer tut. Und also das ist für mich so das, das, das Härteste und das Erschreckendste eigentlich an, an, äh, an der ganzen Situation. Und das zeigt ja auch die patriarchale Gewalt und die Struktur, die ja nicht in einigen Ländern, sondern weltweit herrscht. Tatsächlich. Auch schon allein das Einrollen, dass seine Schwester in diesen Teppich einrollt, das ist auch eins zu eins aus der Dokumentation. Mhm. Ja. Kitty, bitte letzte Frage. Es wird eine lange Nacht. Können wir noch länger machen, lange wollt. Wir, haben, wir haben Zeit, also, oder Sarah? Nein. Nee. <lacht> es muss ja. fliegen. Stimmt. Ich nur hat doch eine Frage, ne? Mhm. Ja, also es ist weniger eine Frage, sondern das hat Sarah ja auch gerade gesagt, dieses Einrollen der, der Schwester im Teppich. Also ich habe mir so gedacht, wie konntet ihr das den Kindern verklickern oder was habt ihr ihnen sozusagen als Aufgabe gegeben zu spielen? Oder Also du kannst ja so einem kleinen Mädchen nicht sagen, so jetzt na, stellen wir das jetzt mal nach, weil den Menschen gab es in echt. Also wie habt ihr das sozusagen hingekriegt, dass ein Kind das unbeschadet, seelisch unbeschadet spielen kann? Das ist eine sehr gute Frage. Dankeschön. Ähm, dazu muss ich dir sagen, oder kann ich sagen, wir hatten, und das war toll, wir hatten die ganze Familie, also der, das, ist, das ist ein echtes Geschwisterpaar, der Junge und das Mädchen, und wir hatten auch beide Eltern da, und zwar für die ganze Zeit der Dreharbeiten. Ja. Und ähm, alle Darsteller, die aus dem Iran kamen, es waren nicht viele, aber es waren einige, die haben sozusagen wirklich aus Selbstschutz, die wussten nur, worum es geht und haben nie das ganze Drehbuch bekommen und haben wirklich nur sozusagen ausschnitthaft die einzelnen Szenen gekriegt. Auch für den Fall, dass falls sie dann eben in den Iran zurückgehen, dass sie dann auch wirklich sagen können, wir wussten nicht genau, was dann passiert. Wir sind eingeladen worden, da mitzumachen und also ne, je nach, so nach dem Motto, je weniger die wissen, desto besser. Wir hatten aber natürlich die Eltern da und hatten in Saar eben als Casting-Direktorin und als Bindeglied zu, der ganzen, zu dem ganzen iranischen Cast, hatten wir sozusagen jemanden, der sehr viele Gespräche geführt hat und es sehr genau erklärt hat, was da passiert ist oder was da passieren wird, wie das passiert. Und es ist sozusagen alles in einem, in einem spielerischen Rahmen entstanden. Die hatten eine ungefähre Ahnung dessen, was da passiert, aber kannten nicht sozusagen den, den ganzen Kontext. So, ja. Ja, weil die Kleine hat ja doch gelächelt. Also es war für sie ja dann auch spielerisch quasi. Ja, ja, definitiv. Und es war eben auch ihr Bruder. ne? Und ihre Eltern waren auch dabei. Wir haben sogar tatsächlich beide Eltern auch sogar noch in dem Film dann äh, verbraten, wenn man so will, weil wir sie, hatten sie da. Und äh, der Vater ist dann nochmal in der Gefängnisszene aufgetaucht, die am Ende rausgeschnitten wurde. Die Mutter an, einem, an einer Essensszene, die man aber, glaube ich, auch jetzt nur noch so im Hintergrund sieht. Also das war... Die Familie war in dem Sinne sozusagen ganz gut eingebettet. Ja. Und die Kinder hatten ja auch Spielerfahrung. Die hatten auch äh, so Kindertheatergruppen ähm, und kannten den Regieassistenten, der halt auch aus dem Iran kommt und ähm, ja. nicht ganz, ganz weit davon weg, was Spiel bedeutet und was nicht. Aber na klar, trotzdem ist es eine eigene Sache, das daran zu führen, gerade bei Kindern. Also Glückwunsch zum Mut, also zu dem Mut, also da gehört ja unglaublich viel Mut dazu, sich diesem The Thema zu nähern, ähm, dieses Thema umzusetzen und in aller Brutalität und Direktheit zu zeigen, das finde ich wirklich auch sehr mutig und, ähm, und ich bin auch sehr dankbar, dass endlich äh, Themen so direkt angesprochen werden und äh, ja. Themen, die man eigentlich auch schon länger kennt, vielleicht nicht aus der iranischen Perspektive, sondern aus ganz anderen Perspektiven. Ja. Vielen Dank. Ich bin halt, also Ali hatte ja mit Border, seinem vorigen Film, wirklich einen überragenden Erfolg. Das ist ja für viele Filmschaffende vor allem auch irgendwie ein totaler Lieblingsfilm. 
Und der, der konnte nach diesem Film, hatte der, konnte der sich wirklich vor Angeboten nicht retten. Ja, also der hätte irgendwie für Disney Hulk machen können, also von da bis da. Aber er hat sich wirklich darauf versteift, so nein, der Erfolg von Border erlaubt mir jetzt, diesen Film zu machen. So, ja. Und ich glaube, als er damals sagte, ich, er droht auszusteigen, haben wir das sehr ernst genommen und es war eine sehr ernstzunehmende Bedrohung. Aber ich glaube, es war für ihn mehr Mittel zum Zweck, dass, dass wir uns bewegen und alle Hebel in Bewegung setzen, weil er wirklich unbedingt diesen Film machen wollte. Und das, das finde ich, ähm, wenn dir sozusagen im übertragenen Sinne die Welt zu so Füßen liegt, also du dir aussuchen kannst, was du machst, aber du wählst dann so genau dieses Thema aus deinem Heimatland aus und weißt genau, du wirst den Finger tief in eine Wunde bohren, das finde ich schon bemerkenswert. So, also ähm, Genau, es ist äh, nicht die einfachste Zusammenarbeit gewesen, das kann ich auch ganz offen sagen. Ähm, es war komplex und, und, äh, und schwierig und ähm, Ali ist im besten Sinne sehr fordern, aber ähm, das Ergebnis spricht da doch ganz letztlich für sich. Ja. Mhm. Maria, ich glaube, du darfst dich selber dran. Ich möchte auch was fragen. <lacht> und zwar, Sarah, ich möchte diese, 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 diese Strangulierszene, die ist so wahnsinnig krass. Also ich weiß gar nicht, wie man sich so einen Drehtag vorstellen muss und wie, wie, du dich, wie, wie man sich darauf vorbereitet und wie, es, wie oft man sowas dreht. Also ich weiß nicht, ob du darüber reden magst, aber mich hat das echt beschäftigt, nachdem ich das angeschaut habe, wie ihr das gemacht habt. Weil das mhm. ist für dich ja auch wirklich eine krasse Erfahrung gewesen sein. Mhm. Also wir hatten gerade einen Stunt-Koordinator am Set und haben vieles äh, durchchoreografiert. Und ähm, ich hatte ja letztendlich auch durch Nico, wegen Nico habe ich ja mit Karate angefangen. Und deswegen kannte ich auch bestimmte Moves und Sachen, die ich da auch wieder an, einsetzen konnte. Und wir hatten auch zum Beispiel so eine Metall, ähm, wie nennt man das, so eine Sch man gebaut, damit sich quasi Meti darauf stellen kann. Aber letztendlich war das halt nicht so ungefährlich, weil das dann rutschig war und dann sollte er halt auch mit dem anderen Bein eigentlich auf meiner Brust stehen und dann habe ich einfach bei, bei, bei dem Proben auch gemerkt, dass es zu extrem ist und dann habe ich zu Ali auch gesagt, dann mach das einmal selber, ähm, weil dann verstehst du, glaube ich, was es heißt, weil er hat es, er, da gab es schon einen Moment, wo er dann dachte, nee, aber wieso, lass uns das doch jetzt machen und so, und dann dachte ich so, nee. Ähm, probier das mal bitte aus und dann hat er das halt ausprobiert, vor allen Dingen als Frau ist es noch was anderes, auf einer Brust zu stehen als als Mann, und dann hat er das halt auch äh, ziemlich eingesehen, was es halt bedeutet. Ähm, und dann haben wir halt auch äh, mit VfXen dann noch zusätzlich gearbeitet, was ja auch am Anfang nicht so geplant war in dem Sinne. Aber das kam dann auch noch dazu. Das war natürlich sehr aufwendig, weil es von allen Seiten, es geht ja auch, wo dann das Gesicht dann halt so schief wird und so welche Sachen. Ähm, genau, also es waren halt eben verschiedene Herangehensweisen. Und ich für mich selbst hatte halt eben, deswegen habe ich das gesagt mit Nico, für mich selber halt überlegt, und Wege gefunden, wie ich da halt so rauskomme, weil es ja trotzdem noch was mit einem macht. Und in dem Fall, wenn man dann noch in einem anderen Land ist, was dann halt auch noch unter anderen Umständen ist, es ist Ramadan, es ist Corona, es ist das und man ist irgendwie auf sich alleine gestellt. Da muss man einfach, ähm, was ich da auf jeden Fall mitgenommen habe, noch mehr als bei anderen Drehs, wie sehr man halt für sich selber einstehen muss. Und wie wichtig es ist, ähm, auch Grenzen zu setzen, gerade als spielende Person. Und weil... Du bist letztendlich alleine. Also egal wer, du musst deine Grenzen setzen und du musst es kommunizieren und dafür einstehen, auch wenn es manchmal nicht so einfach ist vom großen Team. Aber das ist einfach unheimlich wichtig, was ich halt, ähm, wo ich wirklich jeden Spielmenschen nur noch ermutigen kann, das immer wirklich zu machen. Und eben ja. vielleicht auch mal zu sagen, probier es einmal selber aus und dann können wir gerne nochmal darüber in Austausch gehen, um sich auch selber zu schützen und auch die Möglichkeit haben, wirklich professionell weiterarbeiten zu können. Wahnsinn. Wie lange wie habt, lang habt ihr denn da dran gedreht, wenn ich mal fragen darf? Oder wie viele Einstellungen oder wie, wie viele Takes? Das weiß ich, wie viele Einstellungen, das weiß ich nicht mehr. Das ist jetzt echt schon lange her. Also wir hatten ja auch verschiedene Sachen. Ne? Wir hatten, also diese Schlägerszene, die ging ja noch viel länger. Ähm, es waren ja verschiedene Choreografien, die wir dann gemacht haben, um dann im Schnitt quasi, damit Ali im Schnitt dann letztendlich aussuchen kann, in welche Richtung das dann geht und so. Ja. Also, es, äh, ne, also es, es, gab, es gab Schlägereien, es gab irgendwie, Sarah ist sozusagen hinten auf dem Motorrad, ne, fährt sozusagen an so einer Schnellstraße, Autobahn mitten in der Nacht. Äh, wir wollen jetzt mal nicht darüber sprechen, wie in Jordanien eine Autobahn gesperrt wird, ja. Also ich wurde gesperrt, aber wie? Ja, also ich war da sozusagen, bin da, bin da die ganze Nacht mitgefahren, äh, um quasi wenigstens dabei zu sein. Also 
das ist schon, ähm, ja, können wir sozusagen unumwunden zugeben, es ging sozusagen in einigen Teilen wirklich abenteuerlich zu und es war dann ab irgendeinem Punkt, war dann auch klar, ähm, dass wir Produzenten, also Jakob kam dann, obwohl der lange Zeit weg war, kam der dann auf der Hälfte des Drehs nach diesem Steininzident, kam der dann sozusagen auch dazu und dann waren wir auch wirklich eine Zeit lang einfach beide vor Ort und haben uns teilweise wirklich äh, wie noch zusätzliche Satelliten um bestimmte Dinge kümmern müssen. Ich habe zum Beispiel drei Tage lang diesen Hangstand sozusagen am Ende geplant, ähm, quasi als, als wie so eine Art Vorregisseur bis zu dem Punkt, äh, weil ich wusste genau, Ali will das in der totalen drehen und es muss alles durchgespielt werden und, und das muss perfekt aussehen und die verschiedensten Seile und die verschiedensten Hängevorrichtungen und so weiter, alles mehrfach ausprobiert. Also es, es gab, jeder musste sozusagen wirklich eine extra, extra Meile gehen und wir hatten wirklich so viele verschiedene Baustellen, die wir sozusagen zu beackern hatten. Also Sarah hat es gerade angegangen, ne? also Corona gab es ja eben auch noch und äh, und, äh, und die ganzen verschiedenen ähm, kulturellen Aspekte, die es noch zu, zu, dadurch, dass unser Dreh verschoben wurde, sind wir mitten in Ramadan gerutscht. Das Team, teilweise saß so das halbe Team irgendwie auf Teppichen beten und du musstest einfach dann warten, bis sie dann fertig sind damit, dass es dann weiterging. Also es war schon für alle eine große Lernerfahrung auch. Ja? Und ähm, viel Blut, Tränen und Schweiß hat es gekostet. Gibt es noch Fragen oder Kommentare? Dann nehme ich mir das Privileg äh, der Abmoderation. Und zwar ähm, danke erstmal für die Transparenz und das Teilen eurer Erfahrungen. Und ich glaube, gerade ähm, den Punkt, den ihr jetzt gerade am Ende sehr, sehr ähm, diskursiv auch nochmal besprochen habt, der nach Verantwortung und Sicherheit und ähm, es zieht sich tatsächlich durch das, durch den ganzen, durch die ganze Filmbranche, aber jetzt auch durch ähm, dieses Projekt auch zu gucken, wer ist eigentlich äh, beteiligt, ähm, wer kommt in den Credits äh, vor und wer ist dann tatsächlich von einem Berufsverbot auch eventuell ähm, betroffen oder kann vielleicht nie wieder zurück oder vielleicht, wenn die Revolution äh, erfolgreich ist, äh, doch wieder zurück. Ne? Also ich glaube, es sind so Fragen, die branchenübergreifend äh, auch nochmal wichtig sind und die auch nochmal im Film, äh, finde ich, auch sehr sichtbar sind, ähm, so Grenzen zu überschreiten und zu gucken, was passiert dann und welche Gespräche und Diskussionen sind diesbezüglich möglich. Deswegen danke, dass ich heute im Gespräch mit euch sein konnte. Danke an äh, die Akademie, die Filmakademie, die mich heute eingeladen hat. Und danke an euch Zuhörenden, Zuschauenden und ähm, genau, hoffentlich bald. Danke an euch, es war wieder sehr schön. Und danke, Nasperan. Danke, es war natürlich uns toll, dass ihr die Zeit hattet. Danke. Das war wirklich super spannend. Und auch danke nochmal an euch für den Film. Das war wirklich, das ist wirklich großartig. Dankeschön. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank. Alles Gute. Danke. Tschüss, ihr Lieben. Tschüss. Bis bald. Ciao. Tschüss. <lacht>